Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Meeting the 5G XPAL Challenge, sponsored by Ericsson, Fujitsu, Juniper, and Diaby. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. On the right-hand side of your screen is the Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can type your question into the Q&A box and submit your questions to our speakers. All questions will be saved, so if we don't get to answer you, we may follow up via email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow help widget. Here you can find answers to common questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available for download in the green resource list widget. Towards the end of today's presentation, we'll ask for your feedback. The survey will pop open on your screen and will only take one minute to complete. Your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day after the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. I would now like to turn the event over to heavy reading Sterling Perrin. Sterling? Thank you, Kelly, and hello. Welcome, everybody, to today's webinar meeting, the, X, the 5G X Hall Challenge, uh, sponsored by Ericsson, Fujitsu, Juniper, and Viavi. Uh, you'll see in a minute we've got a full roster of speakers here. So uh, my comments will be brief. Um, let me just put this webinar in the context of a, an overall bigger project. So for um, so X Hall is is the term we use in many for the 5G transport, uh, including front hall, mid hall, and back hall. Um, <clears throat> that's the subject of the webinar, and this is part of a larger multi-sponsored project we have going uh, with with this sponsor group, and. Um, includes a survey, uh, which we've actually just closed. We got over 100 uh, operator responses to that survey that has closed, and we are in the process of putting, uh, putting together a report, white paper, based on the results, and that will be distributed uh, free, thanks to our sponsors, to everybody who is attending and registered for this webinar. Uh, there's also going to be a set of videos and a couple of blogs all uh, around this uh, very fertile topic of uh, 5G transport. Let me introduce our speakers here, and they'll really carry us through the rest of the, uh, well, the next, I would say, 45 minutes or so of uh, presenting, and then at the end we'll, we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, but our pre uh, presenters today will be Amit Bardwaj. He's Director of uh, Project Management with Juniper Networks. Uh, he'll be joined by Heyman Malik. He's uh, Global Head of Product Line 5G Transport with Ericsson. Joe Masarino, Principal Solutions Architect uh, with Packet Optical Networking uh, within Fujitsu Network Communications, and then uh, also joined by Reza Baizgami, who is Senior Manager of Product Line Development with Viavi. So we, we will, so they will basically carry us through the uh, remainder of these bullets here uh, as they present, starting with Ericsson giving us a view of how the 5G new radio drives the uh, basically is the driving point for the 5G transport uh, evolution. Then uh, moving into Viavi, who will present on transport synchronization requirements, uh, specifically focusing on front hall there. Then Joe Masterino from Fujitsu will take us through edge transport solutions and the various options, technologies, and architectures for that. And then we'll wrap up with a look at convergence, and we'll bring in uh, Amit from Juniper to carry us through. Um, you're looking at uh, X Hall in the overall context of Metro and Edge. And then, as I said, we'll have time for Q&A. We've actually got a good-sized crowd on this webinar, and we're already getting some questions in, so I think we'll have quite a few, uh, which we definitely welcome. Uh, and if all goes according to plan, we'll have uh, plenty of time for those. So with that, let's uh, bring in Heyman to carry us through the first part of the presentation. Uh, Heyman, I'll hand off to you right now. Thank you, Sterling. Uh, a very warm welcome to everyone uh, on this webinar. I'm glad to be here presenting uh, on the 5G transport. I mean, before I start on the 5G transport, some of the some of the I think data points which which are very important to understand they will impact evolution to 5G as well as uh, on the transport networks which will connect the 5G run with the core. I think what we are seeing is, and this I'm referring to Ericsson Mobility Report, what we are seeing is uh, the mobile subscription from 2018 to 2024 will grow at the CAGR of 2%, which is 
7.9 billion in 2018 all the way 8.9 billion in 2024. Uh, similarly, this smartphone subscription that will move from 5 billion in 2018 to 7.2 billion by 2024, which is 6% CAGR. If I talk about the mobile traffic, mobile data traffic, it will grow from 27 exabytes from 20 to 2018 to 136 exabytes by 2024, which is a 31% CAGR. And similarly, the data for smartphone traffic will be from 24 exabytes to 128, which is again a 32% CAGR. If you look at uh, what will be the situation of traffic on 5G networks in 2024, so 25% of the global traffic will be carried on 5G uh, by 2024. So now I come on to what is driving the uh, bandwidth for transport networks when we evolve from uh, 3G, 4G to 5G? I think there are essentially RAN features or radio network features which are building up to the bandwidth. And uh, we will talk about uh, what are those and how they impact the overall bandwidth. The first thing first is uh, the new spectrum, the NR spectrum. I think uh, the bandwidth which RAN networks can deliver per UE peak and average throughput is actually dependent on how much the spectrum is available. And what we are seeing is the NR spectrum uh, availability is, is pretty much high in mid bands up to 150 megahertz and in high bands up to 800 megahertz. So when we talk about this mid bands and high bands, I just want to mention uh, the low bands we say is below one gigahertz, mid band is one gigahertz to six gigahertz and high band is 24.2 to 86 gigahertz. So it is, is, it is a, a directly proportion of the radio spectrum available. Then we talk about a coordination services. So, so some of the coordination services, uh, which essentially enables more efficiency on the radio networks as well as uh, help to deliver more bandwidth. So we talk about dual connectivity, where in the UE it connects to uh, multiple radio sites so, so that the performance is uh, enhanced. Uh, the signal performance is enhanced and it can help achieve a more uh, average throughput per UE. Then is the spectrum sharing. Spectrum sharing between uh, 4G and 5G. This enables uh, more bandwidth 5G services of the same spectrum which was available on 4G. So service providers can actually shift uh, spectrum between 4G and 5G and enable more bandwidth. Then is the carrier aggregation. I think this is where in multiple radio spots or carriers they can be aggregated to deliver a thicker pipe. So all these coordination services, they actually increase available spectrum or make the uh, more efficient use of the exist existing spectrum for uh, high uh, average and uh, peak UE throughputs. Uh, similar comments on uh, radio functionality. I think uh, with evolution towards 5G, we are seeing a higher modulation. What it means is carrying more traffic on the same amount of spectrum uh, by increasing the modulation. Another technique is beamforming, which is a dedicated radio bandwidth towards a particular UE or set of UE so that it can provide more downlift or upli uplink bandwidth. Then the last but the most important is a massive multi-user MIMO. So what MIMO enables is it enables multiple inputs and multiple outputs for the same set of spectrum so that that can be reused to deliver more bandwidth uh, for the same amount of spectrum. So as we see, there are, there are multiple factors all the way from spectrum itself to the efficiency and the more latest technologies to deliver more bandwidth per UE. Similarly, I think I will talk a little bit more on the architectures. I think as we evolve from 4G towards 5G, the radio architectures are evolving as well. We, we know DRAN, which is actually uh, the flat architecture, wherein the radio and the bas baseband are at the same site. Then we move from DRAN to CRAN. CRAN architecture, wherein is the baseband is located at a central location. This is predominantly used, uh, wherein we need more coordinated services, especially in the uh, higher bands of the spectrum. Then we talk about VRAN. In VRAN, I think the radio functionality or the radio functions and the baseband functions, they all can be split and, and, and uh, 
there are interfaces which are required to connect each other. I'll just talk about those interfaces in a while. And then, of course, eRAN, what it enables is, elastic, we call it elastic RAN, what it enables is it enables a CRAN kind of a baseband pooling functionality, having a DRAN architecture wherein the baseband at various DRAN locations, they can be utilized across the location. So coming to these architectures, uh, you see that it's not only the user traffic, but it is the uh, control traffic itself, uh, which is which is actually required to be transported from one point to another. Uh, if we talk about CRAN, I think uh, this is where the SIPRI uh, interface comes into picture. And uh, uh, as, as you can see on the slide, there are uh, strict latency requirements less than 75 microseconds. And I think the bandwidth varies from 10 to 25 G per sector. Similarly, in the VRAN architecture, I think the bandwidth requirement is also 10 to 25 gigabit per sector and the latency requirements of 75 microseconds. When we talk about uh, eRAN, I think the E5 interface, which connects two uh, node Bs, G node Bs, is the bandwidth goes all the way up to 75 gigs and latency requirements of less than 30 uh, microseconds. So 75 G is actually 3 into 25 G. Over and above, when we see is a, there's a new open ORAN architecture, which can be applied to DRAN, CRAN, or VRAN and all. It talks about more open interfaces, and what it talks about is how to connect a heterogeneous kind of a network, having a radio functions as well as a basement functions uh, separated or, or from a heterogeneous environment. Now, having all these bandwidths and the performance latency uh, requirements, I think uh, it's a critical question how much the networks are prepared today. So where we see today the networks are on the left-hand side, wherein the per site transport requirements are less than 1.5 Gbps, and the interfaces they connect are uh, gigabit interfaces or multiples of gigabit interfaces. Now, when we evolve from baseline capacity coverage to LT evolution gigabit uh, LT towards 5G, I think this is the inflection point. What happens is the transport capacity required moves from less than 1.5 Gbps to all the way up to 20 Gbps, depending upon the uh, spectrum availability, depending upon the uh, uh, connectivity services or the coordination services uh, configured on the radio networks. Similarly, we see uh, the technology, the backhaul, it can be connected using microwave as well as fiber. And of course, the interfaces are, uh, for the front hall especially, are CIPRI, which is a, uh, a native TDM, moving all the way to eCIPRI, which is more towards Ethernet. And the architecture evolution happening from inflection point is, I think, DRAN, CRAN, ERAN to all the way up, DRAN, CRAN, ERAN, VRAN, and ORAN. How to enable all this? I think uh, it's important to understand there are various architectures, and they will evolve over a period of time. The transport networks have to be built once, and what all service providers they need is to build those transport networks today to actually have all these types of DRAN, CRAN, VRAN, and ERAN architecture. There might be cases wherein the operators they evolve from one to another based upon the geography, the services supported, as well as the uh, type of uh, market. Uh, so what it's essential is that transport network has to behave as a toolbox. It can support any interface. As we have seen the various architectures, it should support any medium because there will be more number of 5G sites, and of course, anywhere, any geography, moving from ultra-dense urban to all the way to uh, rural and semi-urban. And connecting this bandwidth and interfaces to a common 5G core. So architectures are changing, but the core is remaining common, and transport has to evolve to support all the uh, functionalities, interfaces, uh, mediums, and number of sites. Last but not the least, I think for efficient transport, uh, uh, networks, it is important to have an end-to-end -end automation and orchestration network. Uh, so if we have, let's say, radio network connected by front hall, back hall, and, and core network, it needs to be managed for an efficient slice, a common orchestration uh, and management function, so that you can deliver a slice uh, service request, which includes uh, a request of latency, bandwidth, or wavelength, etc. And, and can reserve resources and withdraw resources uh, all the way from brand to core uh, through a transport network seamlessly. 
with that, I think I will request my colleague Reza to take over and talk about uh, more detail in the interfaces and the synchronization requirements. Over to you, Reza. Thanks, Raymon. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm here with VRV Solutions, test and measurement company, and we'll cover the transport and synchronization on front hall. Uh, part of the network, as you will see lots of interesting things happening in that part of the network, and we'd like, I'd like to um, uh, provide a little bit more details on that. So, um, but before we get to the new requirements, let's take a look at what we have right now in 4G in terms of front hall. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, Common Public Radio Interface, CIPRI, which is the mainstream technology used for front hall. Very simple technology, synchronous technology, really uh, allows us to develop these uh, simple radios, r light radios that we all know, remote radio heads, and at the same time uh, allows uh, coordination of sites, which is very important when we get to LTE advanced and 5G, comp, etc. We have uh, CIPRI version 7, uh, which allows us to go up to CIPRI rate 10, uh, which is 24 gigabit per second. So uh, good, very simple technology. Uh, but, of course, we wouldn't be talking about it if there was not a challenge with it, which is when we get to 5G. And as we actually already evolved towards 5G, we are seeing more and more bandwidth. Um, uh, Himan talked about it in previous slides. You know, we are talking about a uh, larger number of antennas. The massive MIMO is a big topic. Also, larger bandwidth, signal bandwidth. So we could we go 100 megahertz and higher. So when we... Uh, deal with CIPRI. CIPRI is a very simple technology. It's like TDM in the past. And so it um, multi, uh, basically is inefficient and its bandwidth increases with the number of antennas and signal bandwidth. So we, I put a simple ta a table together. You see when we get to massive MIMO 64 and there are actually higher number of antennas, 128 and etc. We get to uh, optical bandwidths which are in excess of 100 gigabit per second. So that becomes a little bit expensive if you are putting this kind of optics on a radio. And that's why we need a new solution when we get to these new uh, bandwidth requirements. Uh, how we get to the solution, so to understand why uh, we, um, we, we, we have this challenge actually with CIPRI, we need to know where it's coming from. When you look at baseband unit and a radio, most of the processing actually happens in the baseband unit. Uh, we have all these functional elements on the left-hand side. This is uh, down to the phi functionality, and then the radio functionality is in the radio, remote radio head. That's what makes the CIPRI simple, but at the same time very bandwidth inefficient. And so naturally, when we want to talk about a solution, we need to think about whether we need a new functional split where we put maybe some more functionalities into the remote radio head to cut the bandwidth. Uh, lots of discussions have been going on on this functional split for the last four and a half years, but we are going to summarize it and just focus on one application, which is mobility. And so the proposal has been to put some of the phi functionality into the radio, and by doing that, we can actually significantly reduce the bandwidth and make it uh, more uh, actually variable, so it's not constant like in the previous technology CIPRI. It makes much better use of the optical bandwidth and transport network that we have. And at the same time, still allows us to do things that are essential for mobility, which is a coordination of um, multiple radios. And uh, this is very important for mobility application. That's why this option, which is also known as option seven, is so important for eCIPRI. Now, as we get to the transport requirements, the transport requirements for eCIPRI are very similar to CIPRI. So we are talking about a technology which is very latency sensitive. Um, different numbers are being used in different presentations, but I'm going with what CIPRI organization has proposed, 100 microsecond one-way delay between a radio and and the uh, distributed unit or the PBU. And this is primarily for user plane traffic. When we go to CNM control management plane, we got less 
less uh, stringent requirements, 100 millisecond. Uh, 10 minus 7, and again, less stringent with the uh, CNM plane here. Now, of course, when we design networks, we would need to bear in mind the most stringent requirements. That's why most of the uh, uh, focus has been uh, basically on the 100 microsecond, which uh, translates in if you are taking a fiber uh, length, uh, system between a radio, you know the speed of light on fiber, five, um, basically we have five nanosecond per meter. So that translates to maximum of 20 kilometers. In reality, of course, you would like to leave some margins and you are getting somewhere below 20 kilometers. But these are the uh, requirements that have been uh, basically delivered by CIPRI organization. So what it means really for our initial 5G deployments, uh, we are seeing a lot of um, networks that are being designed and uh, primarily right now with dark fiber, short links between the uh, radio units and the distributed units, which are often uh, located at the bottom of tower or in a maybe basement of a building. Uh, but, of course, dark fiber is not quite so efficient. Uh, it's okay for initial uh, low-volume deployments. When we go to higher deployments, in, especially in rural areas, in metro areas, we need something more efficient that makes better use of fiber. So WDM is already being uh, um, tested in the networks. But even WDM, as we know, it's not quite efficient. Still, it's uh, locking bandwidth and locking wavelengths for different radios. And that's why uh, the technology community, the transport vendors, uh, everybody is looking at enhancements for PON. We need new PON technologies for front hall that deliver better delay performance on the uplink. Lots of good work is going on by PON equipment manufacturers and um, other um, participants of the ecosystem. And finally, TSN. And TSN is the timing sensitive network, which is uh, Ethernet based technology. And basically, it was driven, uh, among others, by IEEE 8 to 1 working group, which deals with uh, and it defines the requirements for the uh, basically timing sensitive networks that can carry frontal traffic without breaking the you know the, the radio traffic. And so, basically, it defines two categories for CIPRI traffic, which looks very much like what we had in the CIPRI organization, and for eCIPRI. Again, very similar. It has more categories uh, for uh, mobility, 4G and 5G and R traffic. It says 100 microsecond, but it has also even more stringent uh, class for uh, ultra low latency down to 25 microsecond. So um, we have these requirements from, from the IEEE, and you see lots of that overlaps with what we see from CIPRI and other organizations and manufacturers. And finally, what I would like to um, cover is the synchronization. Of course, as we get to 5G, we are dealing with a lot more uh, radios. And many of them will be in, indoors um, in, in metropolitan areas with limited access to GPS and, uh, or ac ac visibility to GPS satellites or GNSS satellites. So it's very important to provide a network-based synchronization something like PTP and synchronous Ethernet. And that's why it's very important to bear in mind what are the requirements. The requirements for synchronization, really, as in the past with 4G, um, coming from, um, from the 3GPP requirements. And those are usually defined in terms of timing alignment error, time alignment error, TAE. If we translate that if, into our transport networks, they translate into what's known as time error, which is basically the difference between the time you have at the reference point in the network and your reference uh, timing source, which would be GPS, GNSS um, satellites. So those are defined, and for them there are different categories. The categories are determined with why, but, uh, by what the 3GPP uh, applications require. So when we look at the diagram on the right-hand side, there are different use cases. The lowest, um, what is currently also known as uh, category C. Category C is what we have also in 4G backhaul networks. And it is 
translates into a synchronization requirement of a 1.1 microsecond time error. So at any point of the network, you, have, you may not have more than 1.1 microsecond difference to the, uh, the GPS satellite um, reference, right? That's the least demanding. When we get to more demanding applications like interband uh, carrier aggregation, interband non-contiguous carrier aggregation, etc., we get into a category which is known as category B. For that one, you see uh, we have uh, re uh, synchronization requirement which is like 100 to 200 nanoseconds, so much more demanding. And then you've got the category A, that's interband uh, contiguous carrier aggregation, that's category A. And finally, when we get to applications which require MIMO and transmit diversity, this is the one that is the most demanding. And then we get into the 20 to 32 nanosecond range. The reason we have a, this um, a little bit of range in the time error requirements, um, it's the following. Because the, the dependent on application and the implementation of the timing functions, for example, where we place the timing, uh, the telecom slave clock, your margins and your limits change. But you see roughly the requirements and the range, and it's much more uh, stringent when we get into these 5G advanced um, requirements and advanced applications for uh, timing synchronization requirements. So with that, I would like to conclude my part and hand it off to my esteemed colleague, Joe Massarino from Fujitsu. Uh, thank you, Raza. Uh, this is Joe Massarino from Fujitsu, and during this portion of the webinar, I would uh, present advanced Ethernet front wall capabilities and network slicing implementation using cloud control plane with MPLS segment routing. Uh, here's an example of an Ethernet front hall based deployment using time-sensitive networking, or TSN, uh, for 4G, 5G, and Ethernet services. Uh, the illustration depicts a CRAN architecture of central hub location to multiple cell sites in a point-to-multipoint uh, configuration. Uh, the central location is established as a boundary clock passing timing and synchronization information to the remote cell sites using the time-sensitive networking uh, capabilities. 4G SIPRI service channels are encapsulated over Ethernet as radio over Ethernet transport. 5G eSIPRI is already in an Ethernet frame format for the uh, TSN aggregator and transport platform. And Ethernet, uh, excuse me, enterprise data access is passed as Ethernet traffic with preemption, minimizing latency variation on the higher priority traffic, that being timing and sync, 4G and 5G services. Remote visibility and performance monitoring is achieved using standard OEM techniques within the Ethernet protocol uh, technique. The Open RAN Alliance is driving openness and intelligence in the radio access network. An area of openness is the physical layer one low order processing stack, otherwise known as LoFi functional split 7.2x. This is moving from the BBU in the 4G configuration to the 5G RU. In moving this processing function from the hub location to the cell site, the protocol is eSIPRI, which is an Ethernet form of SIPRI that is much more efficient. Applying this concept to the 4G LTE network, as shown here, at the cell site with lo-fi functionality will reduce the SIPRI rate over the front hall up to five times. SIPRI is uh, extremely inefficient and eSIPRI is much more efficient as a result of this uh, reduction in bandwidth. 
This means, for example, uh, a SIPRI 7 10 gigabit per second service channel would be translated to eSIPRI operating as low as 2 gigabits per second over the front hall span. Implementation of LoFi to the 4G remote radio head will require the radio vendor to open up the format of their IQ data within the SIPRI frame. Once the SIPRI is translated to eSIPRI, the service channel connects directly to the 5G virtualized open DU at the hub location, collapsing the two networks into one. Finally, this openness and remotely deployed technology, the service provider will have the flexibility of multi-vendor interoperation. The illustration shown here, very similar to that first slide that I showed, is again a transport uh, network uh, using time-sensitive networking, aggregation and transport for 4G, 5G, and Ethernet services. However, at the cell sites, we have an additional function using ORAN Alliance Lo-Fi Functional Split 7.2x. The Lo-Fi functionality is integrated into the TSN aggregation and transport platform operating as a gateway for 4G traffic to 5G distribution units. Implementing the Lo-Fi Functional Split into the TSN platform at the cell site will translate the SIPRI service channels to eSIPRI, which is a much more efficient Ethernet form, reducing capacity by as much as 5 to 1 over the front hall network. The FLOFI implementation will require the 4G radio vendor to provide openness of their IQ format within the SIPRI frame. The low order phi translation of SIPRI to eSIPRI integrates the 4G network into the 5G network at the hub site through the use of the ORAN Alliant Compliance Open DU. This DU is essentially virtualized as a distribution unit. This integrates the 4G and 5G networks, eliminating the overlay and offers multi-vendor interoperability from cell site to central location. Let's look at the mid-hall and back-hall sections of the uh, edge transport network here. Uh, the mid-hall and back-hall segments of the network will also undergo a major change. With the multiple use cases envisioned for 5G traffic, the point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint -point network will evolve to an SDN mesh network with virtualization. Traditional routers will be challenged since they are comprised of an integrated control and user plane. They may have several chassis to support different capacity versus cost requirements, but the chassis limits will dictate their scalability limit. This is referred to as a scaling up or scaling up to a limit, as defined by the chassis and integrated control and user plane capacity. And an initial network deployment using a traditional router will consist of control and user modules in a chassis that is 20 to 30 percent utilized but the operator will have to allocate the max footprint, power, and thermal reserve. Then there is the performance capacity risk of over or under engineering each site. Deploy a platform too small and not meet demands, or over engineer the site resulting in inefficient CapEx use. Essentially, an integrated control and user plane router platform scales up to a limit, which results in inefficiencies and potential lost revenue opportunities. Network slicing as a service will require 
the network elements to operate with virtualized network functionality. The disaggregated router shown here has an, its control plane in the cloud, an MPLS segment routing user plane in a high performance programmable platform. As the network slices are defined in the network, virtual router instances are configured in the cloud as shown here. Over 100 virtual router instances can be configured for each network element. The cloud control plane will automate and provision metrics using zero-touch provisioning, then push the programming down to the user plane infrastructure. Here I'm showing one network site, but imagine many of these sites configured in a mesh topology, all simplified using this cloud control plane approach. This disaggregated cloud control plane approach offers the ability to scale out, providing multiple virtual router instances per network element and automation interconnecting all the services with required SLA. So finally, on my last slide, I'm showing a network slicing as a service application. This will require elements to operate with virtual network functionality. The disaggregated router shown here will has its control plane in the cloud and MPLS segment routing in the user plane in a high performance programmable uh, platform. As the network slices are defined in the network, virtual routing instances are configured in the cloud. As over 100 of these network routing instances can be deployed in this fashion. As customers VPN are provisioned within the network slices, full resource guarantees and isolation in both the data plane and control plane are administered. Operational cost and complexity is greatly reduced by creating and dynamically managing discrete virtualized networks over a common infrastructure along with automation. The result is one common infrastructure with multiple virtual networks. So let me uh, hand off our next section to my colleague, Emmett. Emmett? Amit, are you on mute? Sorry, thanks a lot, Starling. I was in mute. Okay. okay, thanks. Uh, so thanks, Joe and Starling. So I'll talk about uh, the Metro Fabric uh, in terms of taking all the access and aggregation use cases on a converged infrastructure to provide the lowest TCO. <clears throat> so let's look at what's changing when we look at the Metro networks, right? So today, the Metro networks all the traffic is taken from the access, basically mobile, business, or residential to the edge, and all the services are provided at the edge of the network, right? <clears throat> and as we move from TDM to IP, the networks really did not change that much in, in the sense that <clears throat> all, all the network uh, basically services are provided at the edge of the network, right? And as we move towards the next generation networks, the few things that are changing. One, the content is basically getting hosted in the metro. And as the content is hosted in the metro, which is driven by the video applications, and the second, the cloud's customers basically are moving, moving their <coughs> presence as close as possible to the, to the end customer, which is basically hosting all the peering applications for example, from one stop from the edge customers, from the, from the end customers. And last but not the least, as low latency applications start to be driven from the metro networks, then all more and more content
starts to move into the net networks. So when we look overall <coughs> from a network perspective, you're looking at the flows where in the past the flows were all static, point to point, and now the flows are becoming more diverse in the sense that the flow from the access to the metro, the flows between the applications in the metro, and the flow from the applications in the metro to the edge or in the, in the <coughs> centralized cloud. <clears throat> so with that, let's look at some of the decision criteria as we look, as we look at the fixed and mobile converged network. What are the areas where the customers will have to make decisions and, and what and during those decisions and what are the different technologies that play a part. So as we look at the three key use cases here, one is around the business, residential and mobile. The businesses are connecting to the cloud as the applications are hosted in cloud. There is also a trend to SD-WAN for business services. Residential speeds and feeds are also continuing to grow with NGPON and NGPON technologies. Cable is also going through a complete refresh with, with virtualization of CMTS and the fiber deep architectures, in effect, basically creating a new metro network in the middle. 5G is also trending now currently to the CNN architectures, which basically what we're looking at in the effect is <clears throat> looking, holding all the common needs uh, with trend towards cloudification. And this is the time for converging these into a common infrastructure. As we take that to the edge, the question now is, how do we consolidate the edge? Uh, the, and this is where the node and network slicing starts to come into the play. And looking at the lower layer from the fixed mobile convergence, there are clear trends from an optical perspective. And with these clear inflection points, DWDM is becoming a pluggable. And with this pluggable uh, becoming in, into the routers, we can save tons of space, which honestly can be used for hosting the distributed cloud. And as we look at convergence of this infrastructure, both in the metro and the edge, and even converging from the lower layers into a common infrastructure, the network operations itself become much more simpler because we have fewer elements in the network. So with that, I'm going to talk about basically three key pieces, which is the fixed mobile convergence, cloudification, and the edge consolidation as well in the rest of the presentation. From a fixed mobile convergence perspective, What's changing is that the speeds and feeds are growing to 10 gig, 25 gig on the axis, and then the metro basically gets upgraded to 100 gig rings and beyond. Uh, we're also looking at the new optimal form factors with basically standard optical interfaces that can be integrated into those form factors, driving a common infrastructure for both fixed and mobile. And as part of this, the, the multiple user planes Basically, we're driving multiple user planes with different applications onto a cloud infrastructure, which could be distributed, or this infra cloud infrastructure is basically uh, centralized uh, from, that, from a telco cloud perspective, driving low latency services or high bandwidth services. Uh, and then, then as you look at the cloudification, there are two key protocols that will play a big part. One is eVPN, and other, other one is segment routing. And the key reasons here basically are that as you look at these protocols, uh, technologies, one is the trend towards simplification. Because on its own, eVPN, for example, you don't need any data plane learning. Uh, you can support active active configurations. Uh, with, you need fewer protocols, for example, with segment routing. And uh, these, are <coughs> these, these technologies support both IPv4 and IPv6. But the bigger uh, value of these technologies is because uh, these technologies provide a ubiquitous metro fabric where you can have common overlay, for example, with eVPN, and common transport technologies in the metro as well as in the distributed cloud, in effect providing a ubiquitous fabric in the metro for the applications to move around as well as for connectivity. And the last but not the least is about programmability with these technologies Build well, have the basic programmable infrastructure to apply the, <coughs> the policy on the network. So the now let's look at the last piece here, uh, which is basically around consolidating the edge. And here we expect multiple user planes driving mobile, IoT, business, or residential. 
and the ability to basically have the separate uh, control planes for each of these user planes is what allows not only for different valid domains, but also the ability to scale and maintain uh, independently. And this is basically a concept that you take from the data center environment. They basically think that control plane is a workload which can be expanded to different instances for different user planes in the network. In summary, what we're looking at here is the lots of opportunities basically with convergence for doing more with less, simplifying architectures, and in fact, in fact, really simplifying operations by reducing both OPEX and CAPEX because we're driving towards more convergence and less pieces in the network, but really doing more with the same infrastructure across business, residential, and mobile use cases. So that's my end of the presentation, and I will pass it on to Starling for the Q&A. Great. Thank you, Amit, and thanks to all our presenters. Uh, actually, <coughs> great job, guys. You are, uh, you're right on time. So let's move into the, uh, the Q&A right now. And I uh, actually want to thank the audience as well because you've um, looked forward a ton of questions. So let's just um, jump right into it. The first one, uh, maybe, Heyman, uh, I'll start with you on this one. Uh, it's a little bit lengthy. Let me just kind of read it through. Uh, uh, about East Cipri for RAN on total cost of ownership, uh, saying that the importance of East Cipri on RAN TCO is overestimated. Um, Essentially, de developments in, in silicon photonics are, are bringing down costs, uh, and a statement it makes uh, an intention to reduce transport requirements at the radio equipment expense, not efficient. And the question is, can you please elaborate on the impact of eCIPRI on RAN uh, TCO? Uh, so, Heyman, if you can start that, and if anyone else has a comment, they're welcome as well. Yeah, I think I think it's important to understand the. Uh, Again, I will go to the architectural piece of it. It is important to understand uh, what are the main requirements of the uh, front hall network, right? Uh, the major majority of the concerns are the bandwidth as well as the latency. And, and when we talk about that, of course, there are multiple ways to achieve it. Uh, the two interfaces that we are currently talking is CIPRI and eCIPRI, right? And to transport both of the interfaces, uh, from a RAN perspective, I don't think there is any restriction, right? From a RAN perspective, they only need, it, it can be as simple as a, a fiber connectivity between two endpoints. So there is an option of using a WDM-based uh, uh, front hall network for transporting CIPRI or eCIPRI as well as multiplexing, you know, a lower level of CIPRI interfaces into uh, a 10 gig interface. Uh, to, to optimize uh, the, the fiber infrastructure. So the TCO question is basically how you optimize uh, the fiber infrastructure, how you reduce uh, the requirement of uh, fiber pairs or a single fiber based upon what optical you use, and how many services you can integrate into a single fiber pair. So that is the question. And I think uh, if we compare the technology available today with the WDM uh, 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 passive or active technology, I think uh, the best possible uh, TCOs are achieved today. However, going forward with eCPRI and advancements uh, towards uh, over and I think uh, Ethernet will become technology of the choice as well. Here in again, the competition between the WDM, active passive versus Ethernet, uh, I think it has to be seen how many interfaces, what is the density. Uh, but I think uh, with, with the Ethernet switching functionality being made available with eCPRI, I think the TCOs will be further reduced. So that is an overall comment, if okay. anybody wants yeah. to add. <clears throat> Does anyone have I, I'd like to or? also add a piece to that. Sure. Uh, Sterling. Uh, so this is Joe. Uh, ECIPRI uh, for RAN TCO is uh, also uh, important in that uh, well, ECIPRI is a much more efficient protocol as, as compared to the 4G LTE CIPRI. Uh, protocol. In fact, uh, one of the points that I went through in my slides with the Overan Alliance uh, pulling the uh, low order processing five physical layer one uh, capability out of the BBU and placing it into the 5G RU is one of the reasons why uh, 
5G eCIPRI is more efficient, uh, applying that same concept to 4G uh, technology by placing that functionality in uh, the, a transport platform at the cell site, we'll take that CIPRI and convert it to eCIPRI uh, using that low order phi processor, uh, which will essentially reduce the capacity at which that CIPRI channel is passing over the front wall uh, as high as five to one. Uh, so that, that's a key area uh, in terms of uh, uh, lending to uh, the total cost of ownership for lowering the cost of optics and uh, maximizing on your infrastructure uh, capex uh, to uh, pass traffic over the front wall. Okay, excellent. Let's uh, yeah, let's keep jumping through this again. <clears throat> we have quite a few questions. I want to go to the next one. Uh, you mentioned ORAN. Uh, uh, I bet there is a question on ORAN. Maybe start with Ray's on this one, and then again, if anyone wants to add, but it has to do with uh, requirements and latency, uh, which uh, Ray's you spent some time on. The question is regarding ORAN. What are the latency and bandwidth uh, requirements? Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, thank you. Oran, basically there are two aspects, right? When we talk about transport requirement, the transport requirement for Oran should be the same as it is with what we talked about with eCIPRI or prior to Oran uh, where we didn't have open protocols. So should be the same thing. Now, if you are looking at it from the Oran Alliance perspective, uh, that they are looking at it from the radio, I call it radio, Iran perspective. And those are the people who deal with the application. They talk about uh, transmit windows and receive windows, make sure that we don't miss packets. Uh, so they talk about it in a different way uh, in the Oran documentations. But uh, in, in terms of the transport, what it means for me as a transport engineer, it, it's the same. It should be the same requirement as we had with, uh, prior to Oran with eCBRI. Okay, excellent. Anybody else want to add? No? All right, let's, uh, yeah, in, uh, maybe uh, Amit, bring you in. Uh, there's an interesting comment question from, uh, from an operator. Uh, it has to do with network slicing, um, and the comment, it's basically a comment that's a question. Uh, you don't need segment routing. To support <clears throat> network slicing uh, as a routing company, you could probably comment pretty well on where network slicing applies and doesn't. I mean, we're talking about yeah, network I think, slicing. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think these are two separate concepts, uh, segment routing and uh, network slicing. Uh, so we talk about the network slicing in this case. It's about uh, separating the, you know, the user each user plane there and uh, managing each user plane separately with having a separate control plane uh, instance for each of those user planes. Uh, segment routing is orthogonal to that, how you would implement the, the transport aspect of that in the network. So yeah, the answer, I think the question, the point is valid, and, but from a network perspective, these two are orthogonal things in terms of the solution domain. Oh, you broke up a little bit on the last sentence. You said it's valid, but can you just repeat that? Yes, so the concept is valid for these are in terms of uh, the technologies in the solution domain because one is focused more on the on the transport and the slicing. I think when we talk about separating the control, control plane, that's saying that how do we take each of these user planes, these user planes could be implemented with different technologies, including segment routing for that matter and uh, separating, uh, separately managing each of those user planes with the different control plane instance. Okay, excellent. We got, and uh, we got a couple questions. So we talk a lot about fiber. I'm primarily a fiber person in my coverage, uh, but we do get questions about microwave and the role in 5G. We had probably two questions on that, <clears throat> which can be basically summarized in what is, what is the applicability of microwave when we talk about all these traffic requirements for 5G and maybe, you know, front hall, mid hall, back hall, where in those would it apply? Um, and I'd open that up to anybody who would want to comment on that one. Yeah, and this is Hemant. I would like to comment. I think uh, uh, the, the first statement is uh, microwave is pretty much relevant technology when we look at the 5G transport networks. Uh, and uh, 
I think few reasons are behind it. First is uh, the latency. We we talked about the latency requirements, uh, uh, stringent latency requirements in the 5G network. And I think when we compare microwave networks uh, with the fiber networks, you will be surprised to know that the latency in microwave networks is 20% less or the same distance as compared to fiber network because of uh, the different media uh, which it operates upon. Second is I think there are huge advancements on the microwave technology itself in terms of delivering more bandwidth required for the 5G networks. If, if, I, if I give you current examples, I think we have already demonstrated more than 100 Gbps per link or a distance of a, a little less than two kilometers. So 100 Gbps is, is, is a capacity which is already being demonstrated. And then, and we, if we talk about E-band as a, as a, as a technology for delivering a millimeter or microwave. Uh, it's capable of delivering up to 20 Gbps per link. Now, if we take into consideration all these pictures and we uh, we actually pu put it on the geographical spread, we anticipate 65% uh, of the end radio sites uh, globally uh, will be on microwave. Uh, by 2023, if we take out the North Asian market, which is China and Japan, if we include the North Asian market, uh, then the overall fiber to microwave or millimeter wave ratio would be around 40% uh, of being microwave. And uh, if we if we split out uh, the E band specifically, it will be 20% uh, of the overall size. So I think. Yes, microwave is a very relevant technology for de delivering 5G transport, especially in conditions where it is a high band spectrum and we need uh, many, many more number of uh, sites to uh, provide coverage and capacity. It, it, can, it can provide a front haul, it can provide back haul, and it can provide aggregation services. All right, excellent. Uh, we probably get time for maybe two more questions, so let me just uh, keep moving. Uh, for the audience, though, there should be a survey up in front of you. If you can just take a moment to fill that out, we'd definitely be very interested in your feedback uh, on the, the, the webinar and different topics. Um, next question, Joe, another operator question came in. I believe it related to your question, um, <clears throat> and it is, is there any ring topology possibilities with the TSN, the time-sensitive networking aggregator? Um, I think that's a you question, but if not, uh, somebody sure. Can take it. Yeah. Sure, I could take that. Uh, well, that uh, time-sensitive networking uh, aggregator and transport platform supports uh, three types of traffic, uh, 4G, SIPRI, 5G, eSIPRI, and then Ethernet traffic, Ethernet as in business backhaul, Ethernet services, Wi-Fi, uh, basic uh, uh, Ethernet uh, layer 2 type of uh, services. Uh, for the Ethernet services, yes, uh, ring topology is supported, uh, but uh, for uh, 4G and 5G, which are extremely latency sensitive uh, technologies, it is not. Uh, so that, you know, there are Ethernet front hall platforms uh, that support ring technology using uh, G.8031 and G.8032 type of functionality, but that is only valid for the Ethernet transport uh, uh, services. Uh, the 4G SIPRI and 5G SIPRI being uh, so latency sensitive can only go over point-to-point -point networks, point-to-point, point-to-multipoint uh, type of topologies. All right. Thank you. And yeah, let's uh, try to find a good one to close out on. Um, you know, maybe just kind of a an oddball question. Um, I, you know, because we we did just talk about microwave. We talk about fiber a lot. Uh, we just heard about applicability of microwave. <clears throat> there is a question of on the cable side uh, about DOCSIS in um, again in front hall, mid hall, back hall. Um, I know we're not specific to this in the webinar, but in your discussions and from what you know, and this is for anybody, is is DOCSIS even uh, a viable? option um, for, uh, for for transport, given the requirements we talk about. Um, yeah, I, I can take that one, uh, starting. Yep. I can take that one. So okay. I think it's really key that in the, in the cable space, currently uh, there's a big uh, change happening where 
the cable architectures are changing towards the remote phi or remote Mac phi or what everybody calls that cable DA architecture. And as part of that, everything in the middle is basically becoming a metro ethernet network and the, the CMTS itself starts to get virtualized. So that metro ethernet network is what, uh, if, with what I mentioned in one of my slides, is basically could be the fixed mobile converge network that drives the backhaul, not just for the cable traffic, right? the residential traffic, but also for the mobile traffic in that scenario. So, <clears throat> so in, in effect, basically, all these technologies are sort of converging together uh, from an architectural standpoint, but also from a, uh, from a backhaul standpoint, and, and basically seeding the way towards a truly a converged network. So a very valid question, I think. Uh, but in terms of what the trends are evolving towards, it's definitely evolving towards a more of a converged infrastructure. All right. And uh, with that, we're a little bit past the hour, so we'll have to close out here. Uh, I know our sponsors for the questions we didn't get to. I know they'll be happy to follow up individually. So um, look for that. And as I mentioned, there will be a, a report based on the survey, which I think will also provide additional detail on some of these questions that have come in and some of the topics we've covered uh, with that, I want to thank our presenters for their excellent presentations uh, in coordination on working on this webinar and project, and also thank you, the audience, for tuning in and for your great questions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.